Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Somebody asked me about the wise and foolish virgins that were told to buy some oil in Matthew 25. So let's read about that. It confused me. I'm still not 100% sure about it, but I'm going to give this my best shot. All right, Matthew 25, verse 1. Jesus speaking, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Obviously, this is Christ, right? The bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Okay, now we are going to take a look at oil. All right, so, verse 4. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. I guess this is an indicative of the church being asleep, right? And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answer, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Now, that's the thing. Oil has a number of meanings in Scripture. Some people say even the Holy Spirit. So how do you buy the Holy Spirit? Well, we'll get back to that. Verse 10, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. All right, so what about oil? Well, in the King James, usually the first time that the word appears in the Bible will usually give you an indication of what the word means in its context. But sadly, that's not really helping me much here. Go to Genesis 28, and verse 18. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. So this was Jacob's pillar. Um... Uh, you could read about it in Genesis 28 and um, used it to rest his head. And what did he do? He took some oil and basically anointed the stone to make a pillar out of it. Genesis 35, 14, And Jacob set up a pillar in the places where he talked with him even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. Exodus 25, 6, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and 
for sweet incense. Now, did you know that you could take olive oil and it'll burn? You could take a piece of cloth, dip it in the oil, and use it like a, can a candle or an oil lamp. But they also would take it and add spices to it to make an anointing oil. Exodus 27, 20. And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil olive, pure oil olive beaten for the light, for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. So what do you do? What does a lamp do? It gives you light. What does Jesus say he is? The light of the world. So is there a connection there? Exodus 29 verse 2, and unleavened bread and cakes, unleavened, unleavened, tempered with oil, and wafers, unleavened, anointed with oil of wheat and flour, shalt thou make them. Jesus is the bread of life, right? Unleavened bread. Leaven was always uh, likened unto sin in the Bible. Uh, remember when Jesus said, Beware the leaven of the leaven of Herod and of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. If you don't know it, yeah, I, I don't want to go and go there and look at it, but for this once, take my word for it. So, what is what is unleavened bread made out of? Wheat, Jesus is the bread of life, water, uh, like what they would do for baptism, right? Oil. So, there you go. Exodus 29, verse 7, Then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. Um, some say that that is indicative of the a shadow of the coming Holy Spirit. Exodus 29, 21. And thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron. Now, Aaron was the high priest when Moses was leading everybody out of Egypt. Aaron was of the tribe of Levi. He was a Levite. And he served the Lord. So they were taking anointing oil, sprinkle, sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon the garments of his sons with him, and he shall be hallowed. Huh. And his garments and his sons and his sons' garments with him. So anointing oil. Exodus 30 and verse 25. And thou shalt make it an oil of holy oil ointment and oil of holy ointment an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary apothecary it shall be an holy anointing oil okay an holy anointing oil how about leviticus 8:12 and he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. Now, look at this. Here's where we're starting to get into the meat and potatoes. 1 Samuel chapter 16, we're going to read verse 1, and then we're going to read verse 13. And the Lord said unto Samuel, now Samuel was uh, the prophet, I think he was a priest too, uh, and he served the Lord in the tab tabernacle. Uh, he was a Levite. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethle Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Verse 13, 
Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So Samuel was told, fill the horn with oil and go. And then he anointed King David with the, with the oil. And then the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, came upon David. Think about that. I mean, you know, this is why um, the Holy the oil, the anoint, being anointed with oil was indicative of the Holy Spirit. Well, in the Old Testament. Now, if there's one psalm that almost everybody knows, it's the 23rd psalm. We won't read the whole thing. We're just going to read verse 5. King David said, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Beautiful psalm. Psalm 89.20 I have found David my servant with my holy oil. Have I anointed him? Okay. All right, let's hit the New Testament. Mark 6, verse 13. And they, the disciples, and they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Very interesting, huh? Well, I think so. Maybe you don't, but I do. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 10. All righty. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this is a lawyer of, you know, Bible law, not a lawyer like today. A lot of people don't know it, but Harvard, Princeton, Yale were all started as Bible colleges. And their law school, well, their textbook was the Bible. But that was a long time ago. Verse 26, Jesus speaking, he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Now, just remember something. The Lord wanted Israel, his people, to dwell alone with each other. Okay? He didn't want us living in the, you know, multicultural world, and he sure didn't want us living next door to a bunch of Satanists. Okay? I mean, you know, really? I think if you got Satanists as neighbors, maybe you should move. I don't know. That's just me. So love the Lord, love thy neighbor. And he, Jesus, said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Oh boy, you want to get in trouble? Ask Jesus a question. I guarantee you every time you're going to look like a fool. I know because I was that fool many a times. And Jesus answering him said, oh boy, here we go. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance and by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. Oh here it is, you got a priest of God, wouldn't lift a finger to help him, right? And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, now remember, Samaria was the capital of northern Israel. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, 
and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Now, I just did a Bible study on wine. What was wine indicative of? Christ said it was his blood. All right? Now, if you don't believe me, write me and say, well, oh, Bob, you're full of, you know what, but yeah. Um, you know, Jesus said, this is the blood of my new covenant, the wine. So what did he pour into his side? Wine, which is indicative of the blood of Christ, into the wound, and not only that, but wine's got alcohol in it, which is a good antiseptic, right? And the blood of Christ is a good antiseptic for sin. But when you got the blood of Christ, what else comes? Oil, the Holy Spirit, right? And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, like a hotel, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, which is like uh, two days' wages, and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Good lesson, huh? Go and do thou likewise. And who is my neighbor? Oh boy, you don't want to ask Jesus questions. As the Pharisees and the Sadducees found out, right? In the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, and verse 9, it says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness, anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. James, chapter 5, and verse 4, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Oh, yeah. All right, so let's go back to Matthew 25, 5, where the, the, the virgins, the wise and the foolish ones, right? Matthew 25, 5, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Why do you trim the lamp? Well, you know, because the ends, when they get uh, burned up, they're, you know, you just have carbon and they don't, they don't burn. You don't get much, you don't get any light. So you got to trim them every once in a while. A fresh wick, right? Got to keep that lamp going. The light of the world, right? Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Is this talking about the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I don't know. I'll be honest with you. I'm not sure the exact application here. So use your imagination a little bit, because your guess would be as good as mine. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you, but go rather to them that sell and buy, buy for yourselves. Buy. That is going to be, I think, the ticket. I did a little bit of research on this, and I think that's going to be it. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. All right, so 
what does buy? You know, when he told him, well, go buy some oil. Now, in the Old Testament, you got some really interesting things about buying, buying, purchasing. In Matthew 21, verse 12, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought. You know, it means it's, uh, it's the same word as buy. It's just using a different tense. Buy and bought. You know, uh, if you want to buy a car, it's in the present tense. Oh, I bought a car yesterday. That's past tense. But it's the same word in the Greek. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers. Oh, I wish we had Jesus come back and overthrow the money changers' tables today. Uh, the bankers, yeah. And the seats of them that sold doves. All right, so... Here it is. These people were buying and selling in the temple. And it's the same word, you know, buy, bought. Now, there was a uh, great multitude listening to Jesus. And Matthew 14 and verse 15. So he's got a big crowd there, right? And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. In other words, it's late. Send this multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. In other words, you know, it's evening, it's late. You know, send these people out of here so they can go buy themselves dinner, you know. And what did Jesus do? You know, this is when he turned the, um, the loaves and fed everybody. You know, this is that instant. But this is the word where they used buy. You know, let them go out and buy some food. All right? But there's other applications of the same word. So let's take a look at it. Uh, Mark 6.36. Uh, it's, a, it's an alternate version of what we just read or perhaps a different instance. So send them away that they may go into the country roundabout and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. All right, so what else does this word buy mean? Well, here's the same word used in a different context. Here's Paul, you know, those people that hate Paul. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Holy Spirit, right? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought, B-O-U-G-H-T, for ye are bought with a price. What price were we bought with? Did Jesus pull out some uh, silver coins and uh, like uh, Judas Iscariot got for, uh, for betraying Christ? What was it, 20 or 30 pieces of silver? I forget, 20 or 30. Uh, no, Jesus didn't buy us with silver coins. He bought us with his life and with his blood. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Um, does this make a little bit of sense? First Corinthians 7.23 Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. How about 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1? 
But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. How come uh, Christians are stupid and they don't read this every time they turn on TVN? Why? But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Okay. Revelation 3.18. Maybe this will, you know, read something into this. It says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou that thou mayest see. Are we supposed to buy something? Are, are, is he talking about buying gold with coins? Or is he telling us to buy something with our lives? Just like, you know, Jesus bought us by his own blood, by his life. That's kind of how I see this. Uh, if you got a different opinion, that's okay. You know, maybe you knew better than I do. Listen to this. Revelation 5 and verse 9. And they sang, uh, sung a new song. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou hast slain and hast redeemed us to God. Do you know that word redeemed is the same word for buy and bought? It's the same word. You know, if you had, oh, I don't know, let's say you had a, oh, uh, I don't know, a, you had a, a trinket, and you went to the pawn shop, and you say, pawn shop, I'd like to uh, pawn this trinket. I need some cash. And they say, all right, we'll give you $200 for it. But in 30 days, you got to give us, you know, if you come back within 30 days, you got to give us $250 back for the pleasure of loaning you 50, you know, 200 bucks. So they give you 200 bucks. They get your trinket. You come back in 28 days or 29 days, whatever. 250 bucks, you know, you had a good week or whatever. You got paid your boss. Uh, you redeemed your trinket. All right, so for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Did you know that Christ redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation? Redeemed. It means he bought us. He paid. It's the same word. Redeemed and buy and bought. It's the same word. Revelation 14.3 And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed... Same word, redeemed from the earth. So, very interesting, huh? Well, I know. I've got a boring life if I think that's interesting, right? Probably the world would say. I don't think so, but I got something else I want to show you here. Let's take a look at Matthew 13 and verse 44. Maybe this will give you a new perspective on this parable. 
Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. Remember in the wheat and the tares, Jesus said the field is the world. What is the treasure hid in the field? Israel. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field for joy goeth there thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field again the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it so who was the man that went and sold everything that he had and bought the field seeking those goodly pearls the pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it Christ by his blood by his life hath redeemed us from hell and death so that we might be raised up in his glory does that make sense to you now it's not talking about a piece of land it's not talking about an actual pearl Christ considers us his treasure hid in a field think about that people Think about that. You know, I've said it before, and, you know, the Bible's God's love letter to Israel. When you think about it, it really is. So does, uh, does it make a little bit of sense now when the Lord uh, said that the five virgins with the oil and the five foolish that didn't have the oil, maybe they didn't, give of themselves maybe the holy spirit left them uh, maybe they never had it i don't know i do know one thing the bible says that our names can be blotted out of the book of life you don't believe me i've got a bible study on it you know that's a scary thing. When you think that your name could be blotted out of the book of life, that's scary, people. That's why Jesus said, He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. There's a reason he said that stuff, you know? So, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, there's, a, there's some loose ends that I don't, understand totally you know we probably won't understand these things until the kingdom if we be found worthy and you know we're relying on men's interpretations of what these words mean and words change in meaning uh, there's a guy that has a lexicon his name is Henry Thayer T-H-A-Y-E-R. And people just, you know, they rely on that when they go to Bible cemetery. I mean, uh, seminary, Bible college. I got it right the first time. Bible cemetery. He didn't even believe that Jesus Christ was God. He just said, well, you know, he was just a good, a good guy, you know. And his word definitions reflect that. And what happens, if, you know, when people say to me, oh, well, you know, I read the original Greek. Translated by who? By Henry Thayer? If you if you listen to his word studies in the New Testament, the King James Bible, like 1 Timothy 3.16, where it says God was manifested in the flesh, he'll say, oh, no, no, no. That, that word God there, that's a mistranslation. You know, uh, he'll tell you, well, Jesus... The, the, the modern Bibles will say he appeared in a body. Well, guess what? Every single person that's ever been born on the earth has appeared in a body. Every single one. 
Does that, how does that make Jesus special? What does that do to the virgin birth? Oh, well, that, that word virgin really doesn't mean virgin. It just means she was a young woman. Yeah, what about that uh, gal down in uh, South America that got pregnant at five years old, gave birth at six? Yeah, she's still alive, from what I understand. Was that a miracle? I don't think so. Boy, I tell you what, if that was my five-year-old daughter and I found out who was uh, doing that, um, I'd probably cut their throat with a machete. And, yeah, and mail the head to their family. But, yeah, what can I tell you? Uh, all right, well, all blessings, praise, glory, glory and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to him and him alone. In Jesus' precious name, amen.